and welcome to Northbridge Church. We're so glad you could make it. Would you stand to worship with us this morning? Sing, Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Mighty in strength. You are faithful. excited you're here. You are special to us. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we would love to, to know that you're with us today. If you'd just take a moment, the little, when you came in, you received a little handout. Inside the handout, there's a little uh, card that looks just like this. And, and just take a moment to, before you leave today to fill that out. On your way out the door, there's a little uh, basket over in our Connection Center. You can drop that in. There's a little box over in our Giving Center. You can drop that in. Again, it's just our way of just uh, ma making a connection with you in whatever way uh, that we can. Uh, out in the cafe area, there's, there's there's coffee, bagels, donuts, anything that you see out there, grab, bring it in here. Our prayers, our hope is that you experience what you need to experience from God today. And we just want you to worship uh, as you feel God leading you to worship. We're excited about what God is going to do today as we get an opportunity to worship Him uh, in, in song. We get an opportunity to worship Him as we open God's Word today. So we're excited uh, about what that's going to look like. And I pray that it's, uh, it's what you need to hear today. So go ahead and take a moment to greet someone around you, and we'll get going in just a minute. Yeah. 
I know. It's, it's, it's a lot different experience for us. I bet it is. Yeah. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. One more time. Terry. Terry. Yes, sir. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I'll follow. Thank you. 
Yeah. 
that you will just open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts just to see, to hear, to feel your word, Lord. Father God, we thank you for what you're going to do in this place. We thank you for meeting here with us. We praise your name for all that you are. We thank you that you hear and answer our prayers. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, go ahead and be seated, and we're going to turn up the lights, and I uh, just want to welcome you also. Glad you're here. Recognize we have a full house today. A lot of, a lot of folks here for a baptism, coming here to see your friends baptized. I uh, want to say uh, you are welcome. We are so happy you're here. Uh, one of the things, you know, a lot of people, they come to a church, and, and they visit a church, and, you know, there are a lot of churches in America that don't aren't prepared for a guest or aren't prepared for a visitor of any kind, and and uh, for us, that's just commonplace to our church that we know guests are here and you are recognized and you are welcomed. And uh, we're so happy you're with us. We're uh, talking, going through a series uh, on spiritual warfare. And, you know, to someone who may be, you know, kind of far from Christ or they're investigating the claims of Christ and you're not so much into the spiritual stuff, you know, that'd be kind of like, okay, spiritual warfare, Tony, what is that all about? I mean, is this, are we going to show episodes of The Exorcist or something like that? Uh, is that your definition? No, what we're doing is we're recognizing and we're going to go to this passage in just a moment. And, uh, you know, all throughout Scripture talks about that there's a seen world and there is the unseen world. Pastor Mike did an awesome job last week just looking at the physical elements, looking at how in our spectrum of particles, there's a very narrow spectrum that we can see and there's a very wide spectrum of radio waves and x-rays and protons and 
all sorts of you know gamma rays and stuff like that. And we recognize that those waves exist. We don't question those. We don't think that's some crazy talk out there. And so if we're willing to accept that, we also recognize that uh, in what we see is a very narrow view of reality, there's a wide view of spiritual reality of what's going on around us. And so we're just looking at taking time to investigate specifically in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, church planter, evangelist, pastor, uh, God used him greatly in the first generation of Christianity to give us insight, and, and he was giving us insight about how to go about the spiritual, how, how to go about life when there's spiritual attack in our lives, and when, we're, when we are pressed, when we are feeling uh, the enemy pushing in into our lives, how do we respond? And so we're just taking time to unpack this passage together. And uh, today, man, have I have I got a cool a cool prop for us today? I'm so excited about this prop. My wife hasn't even seen this yet. She doesn't even know what I'm what I purchased. Uh, this, you know, and hey, it's it's for the Lord, so I had to do it, right? Um, so yeah, I bought a sword this week. How cool is that? And again, I, 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 there's better ways, better things to use my money on than buying a sword. But you know, I had to had to buy a sword. You know, everyone needs every guy needs a broadsword of some kind. I've discovered in life, right? Every guy needs a sword. How and, and you know, and I've I've had a bit of a martial arts background, and and you know, I've been a bit of a nerd over the years. So yeah, you know, there's that that dungeon and dragon kind of thing going on sometimes in my life, and and uh, you know, I've seen some pretty cool things done with swords uh, over the years. You know, there's a guy that I saw that was a cavalry dude. He, had a, he was in full gallop on a horse, um, had a cavalry broadsword, and he, I saw him in full gallop, Glenn, cantaloupe on five-foot pikes on his right and to his left. And as he was in full gallop, take his broadsword, whoosh, cut through cantaloupe, whoosh, cut through cantaloupe, cut through cantaloupe. And if you're sitting there saying, well, that's easy. I can do that. Let me tell you, no, you can't. No, you can't. Okay. This is, that's hard stuff to do. Impressive. Incredibly impressive. I uh, saw so a guy, I was in the martial arts, I was black belt in, in Kempo Karate. And, and uh, there was this, I was at a demonstration with this guy that had a samurai sword, you know, a katana is what it's called. And he had one of his students, had to be a trusting student, lay on a bench, put a tomato on his throat. This katana was razor sharp. It's not like this sword. This is a Knights of Columbus sword. Trust me, there's probably some people out there just knowing I'm going to get cut. It's, it's dull, okay? It's a dull sword. Got the pointy end at the end. Was investigating putting a cork on it maybe, you know, to protect myself. But, but I'm not going to get hurt, I promise, okay? But, but this guy had a katana sword, razor sharp, just, ah! And just swung it as fast as he could, hard as he could, cut the tomato in half to the guy's throat, and the guy was fine, you know? And I'm thinking... Holy cow, that's impressive. Me, I'd be in jail after I did a demonstration like that, okay? That's incredible, incredible how these people owned and handled their swords. In weapon training, they talk about swords as being an extension of the body. Uh, if you're truly adept with a sword, when you put it in your hand, it should feel like just a part of your arm. It's just a part of your body, right? And so we're today, guess, guess what we're going to be talking about today? The, the sword of the spirit, right? There you go. You know, you, you don't have to be a rocket science to know, you know, you'd have been shocked if I said, we're talking about breastplate of righteousness, you know. No, we're talking about the sword of the spirit today that's found in Ephesians chapter six. Uh, and so Pastor Mike did this last week and I just, I love the practice. So we're just going to do it. Even though we're not looking at all of this passage today, uh, it's just good and healthy for us to read the whole passage that we're kind of camping out in for the next six or seven weeks. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, if you have a copy of scriptures, I invite you to tune in or uh, turn to it, uh, to dial it up. If, you're, if you've got it online on an on a electronic device, we also have it on our screens if you didn't bring a copy of scriptures with you. Uh, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote, the church planter by the name of Paul, he wrote this. He said in verse 10, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the all of God's armor 
so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places, Paul writes. And he says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Let me give you a story, an illustration here. Okay? Now, I don't know why this is. We could, we could argue and debate this for, for hours about what's happened, but I've observed in the last six or seven years, there have been... Uh, an explosion of television shows and movies that are like apocalyptic movies. You know, uh, the end of the world and a remnant has to survive in the midst of the world. And you could pick the reason for the apocalypse. It could be zombies or some kind of super bug or maybe some foreign enemy invading. Uh, it could be uh, an EMP explosion and, and all of a sudden all of modern conveniences are gone. Whatever the reason... Uh, we, we just you pick the TV show, you pick the movie, uh, and, and 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 now you're engaged and tuned in to watching the end of the world. Okay, so for for the point of that, let's pretend. Let's just pretend we're there. Okay, my wife she is concerned about me. She thinks sometimes I pretend too often that we're there uh, when I start buying stuff, right? And buying swords and stuff like that. Uh, and so so let's pretend we're there. And and because we're in the apocalypse, all of us, all of us are now in a battalion. We all have to fight for our survival. I don't care your age. I don't care your sex. I don't care if gout affects you on the rainy days. We are all in military combat. Okay, We're the first brigade of Northbridge Church. And, and let's, let's say, for the purpose of this discussion, that, uh, that we, are given, we are given orders that we're going into a, a, a very sensitive mission. We all have to go. We have no choice. It's for the survival of humanity. And this mission has to be accomplished. We know that there's going to be a high mortality rate, meaning uh, many of us are not coming back from this mission. And so we go to gear up, right? And, and the sergeant at arms gives us the best footwear. I mean, you know, this footwear, uh, the thermal properties of this footwear, our feet will never get cold. The, the slippage factor on the soles, uh, there is no surface out there that we're going to slip on. This is the best footwear we'll be given. We've been given great belt wear, webbing uh, to put on ourselves, strap on ourselves, to put all of our gear on. We've been given body armor that's incredible. You take a high-powered round, hit your center mass, and you're going to keep on moving, right? It's the greatest body armor. We're given helmets. Helmet that's made out of Kevlar. I mean, you can put a hand grenade on this, on this helmet. It's going to come out fine. But as we're gearing up with all of this equipment, all of our body armor, our helmets, our boots, we're putting on, strapping on the, these belts to put our equipment on, uh, put on communication devices to communicate with one another and communicate with our leadership. The sergeant arm says, oh, yeah, there's a problem. Uh, we ran out of bullets, so you are not going to be equipped with any kind of weapon." There are no guns. There's nothing like that. How confident would you be having the best, the best defensive body armor and defensive equipment, and you would be walking into a conflict knowing that you can't shoot back at the enemy? Would you be very confident in that? I, I would argue. Most of you are staring at me saying, hey, whatever. I don't know why you're even talking about. It. No, the answer is no, you would not be. Okay? No, you would not be confident in, in, in being in that kind of scenario. Now, the question I have for you is how well do you handle your sword? Because if you are a follower of Christ, if you've submitted your life to the cause of Jesus and you've invited him into your life and you're living under his lordship, then the reality is you're in a spiritual conflict, whether you realize it or not. And yet, to be, to be honest with you, there are days that I'm keenly aware of the spiritual conflict that Tony Turner is in. And, and there are also days that I'm not so aware, you know, and I kind of, things just kind of pass me by and I miss it. You know, I miss those, 
opportunities or I miss what's going on. Not aware of that. But that does not take away from the fact that, that it's still happening. It's still going on around me. And, and the reality is God has equipped us with a lot of defensive things, and he's also equipped us with offensive tools to aid us in these spiritual things that happen in our lives. When the enemy starts pushing in on us, when we start feeling uh, the enemy trying to, to overpower what's going on within us, what's going on through us. And, and I would submit to you that there's a lot of Christians, when I ask the question, how well are you at handling your sword, the truthful answer is, not so much. I, re I rely on my pastor. I rely on a small group leader. I rely on other people to be adept. That's what I pay them for. But for me, not too good. Well, I would argue that that's who you are, then you're primarily living a defensive life. You're primarily living a defensive battle tactic in your life. And let me tell you, uh, the best offense is not a good defense in this kind of conflict. You see, over 20 years of ministry, I've met people who, uh, who, who say, hey, you know, Tony, my goal in life is just I want to raise my kids and that they're responsible people and, and they're doing good and, you know, and bad things just not happen to my family. And as long as that happens, then that's success. You know, it's a defensive mindset. It's a fort mindset. The problem with that is it only takes one time. It only takes one thing to happen for you to say, I failed. This is failure. I just experienced one tragedy. I experienced one bad thing in life. When you're living a defensive mode in spiritual world, then just one time the enemy gets through your defenses and you're rocked. Your world is shattered then. And you don't know how to pick up the pieces at that moment. It's only when we're living an offensive uh, tactic in our mind that we are taking ground for the kingdom of God in our lives. We're taking the sword of the Spirit and using it, uh, using it uh, when the enemy comes at me or comes at us. It's only then that we can experience true and total victory in our lives. You see, I, I've mentioned already that I was a martial artist and, uh, you know, I, some would say good, some would say not so good. I don't, I don't know. You'd be the judge, you know. Um, there was a time, I don't know what it was, I was watching too much Kung Fu from the 70s. You remember that show in the 70s, Kung Fu? I don't know if I was watching that and allowing that to impact me, but there was a stage early on in my martial art development that I was like, I do want to do no harm to anybody. I don't want to hurt them. If someone came at me, I just want to. And so I decided what I'd do is be really good at blocking. If I could become the master at blocking. And so I told my instructor what I was going to do. And I, you know, I'd become just perfect at blocking and, and do all these blocks. And so if I ever had to defend myself, I'd just, you know, come, come, the person come at me and I could just block everything, all right? Just do all these blocks, you know, all these block stuff. And then just wait. And then surely I'd wear them down or the authorities would come and drag them off, right? That would be my theory and how I was going to approach my martial arts training. I told Dennis, hey, I'm not so interested in learning strikes. Don't need to learn any of those things because I'm just going to become a master blocker. And, uh, oh, this guy, he, he different cat, different individual. But uh, he did one thing definitely right here. And he said, oh, let's, let's check, try this theory out, Tony. And so he had another student that was like me, uh, similar uh, size, similar in uh, weight class, similar uh, belt classing. And he said, just take him out, dude. Take Tony out. Just go after him. And so he's throwing punches and kicks, and I'm blocking. Ah, yeah, I'm better than him, feeling good. And you know, one got through, you know, ribs, but you know, he had gloves on, so it didn't hurt. So, hey, that's okay. One can go through. Another one came through and hit me in the head. Again, he had gloves on. I wasn't too rattled. You know, hey, I'm okay there. We can keep on going and just block. And so Dennis said, okay, it's my turn. Let me try now. And so he comes over and I'm like, okay, well, hey, you're better than me. But if I can, if I can defend you, then this is a rock solid plan. What I didn't see Dennis have next to him alongside his leg, he had a, a, a cushion stick. He had a stick with foam around it. Now, let me tell you, you know, those, those, those sound nice, but I think the foam around the stick is to protect the stick myself. It's certainly not to protect your head because when he hit me upside the head with this thing, I was seeing stars for five minutes. And, and I saw the reality. It only takes one stick to hit you outside the head and you're rattled and you're done for. Now, I learned physically you know what? I have to be offensive and defensive. And I believe that that little happening in life, you know, that instructed me about my martial arts is instructive also for how we do life in general. And that is God has given us the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so again, I ask you, 
how are you at handling the sword of the Spirit? Because if we're being honest, most of us would say, not too good, not too good. I, I require my pastor. My pastor needs comes. I expect you, Tony. I expect John. I expect, I expect Dave, Mike, Christy, whoever's up here. I expect them to be good at it. And then that's what I'm relying on is Sunday, I'm being filled up with the Word of God, and there you go. And you know what? <laughs> hey, that's great for Sunday, folks. I'm glad you're here on Sunday. Trust me, I'd rather you be here than anywhere else. But my problem is... I've experienced great times on Sunday where, you know, someone else has poured into my life God's Word and having great insight, but then Wednesday comes or Thursday comes and something rocks me. And you know what? The pastor's not there to pour into my life at that moment. So what happens? Do I just stay rocked until the following Sunday? Or do I have the ability to respond with the sword of the Spirit and am able to work through those things in life, in the midst of life. So what I've done today is, is you know, golly, if you're expecting like, a, if you're hoping to have some really super inspirational talk right now where you're ready to go charge hell with a water pistol, don't really have that for you today. Um, what I have for you today is just a very practical talk about how to better, better handle the sword of the Spirit. Just some things I've learned in life that, that could help you. So if you're taking notes, you might want to, Write some notes down here. I have, I have four keys to getting a better handle, a better grip on your sword, okay? Uh, so let's talk about the first one. The first one is to focus on change behavior, not on trivia. Focus on change behavior, not on trivia. Uh, the scripture, Peter's talking here, uh, and he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must be you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters love each other deeply with all your heart. I want to focus on the first part of this scripture. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. Notice Peter didn't say you were cleansed from your sins when you won at Bible trivia. You were cleansed from your sins when you went through catechism class. You were cleansed from sin when you received a PhD from a, from a seminary somewhere. Nowhere in Scripture do people get patted on the head or get a, a prize for learning trivia about the Bible. But what the Scripture, what God is concerned about as you read His Word, is He is concerned about changed behavior. He is concerned about obedience, about taking the Word of God and not just learning about the Word of God, but actually allowing it to change you from the inside out and you become different. You, you begin to do what the Word says. And so... For us, we need to focus on the change behavior. Uh, you know, that's one reason why, you know, there's all sorts of tools out there for children to help children get involved in the Word of God. And, and hear me clearly. I mean, those are good tools. But for so often in life, we've, uh, we've thought that, okay, if I take my kid and I get my kid to memorize one scripture a week for the next 52 weeks, they're going to learn 52 scriptures. And so life is good. Everything's good, right? Well, if the goal is just getting them to memorize something and you never talk about the application, there's a problem. There's a problem there. You know, I, you know some of the best pagans I've met uh, going into college, they scored the best. They were prolific in, as children and teenagers and Bible drillers. You know, they knew all this stuff, but they never once knew how to apply it into their lives. And what I would argue, God's not too impressed with you learning and knowing who was the man who, who tried to touch the Ark of the Covenant and died. He doesn't really care if you know who that person is versus knowing about mercy and love and practicing mercy and love in your world. God's not too impressed if you can say, what is the first, what's the exact center verse in the Bible? Or what's the shortest verse? Or what's the longest verse? Or what's the longest chapter? Or what's the shortest chapter? Or any, he's not impressed if you know those facts. He's impressed with obedience, knowing and doing the will of God in your life. And so for me, as I encounter God's word and as I'm reading through it, you know, there's some things that I do that help with this I, so I don't get caught up in learning of, wow, Samson was one of the strongest men to ever live or anything like that. What I do is I ask myself a couple of different questions through, through my Bible study. One of the questions I ask is, is there a habit that I see being lived out in what I'm studying right now that I need to develop in my life? Or conversely, is there a habit that I have 
Is there an approach to life that I'm taking right now that I'm reading Scripture saying to flee from? And I need to run away from. Is there something I need to develop? Is there something I need to take away? Is there, uh, is, should I, what should I begin uh, looking uh, for God to take away from my life? You know, those are the, the things that I ask myself to help myself steer away from just the trivia knowledge and look to deeper issues as I'm reading God's word. A second uh, point, a second key to handling the sword of the spirit is understand that the scriptures are a chat session with God. You say, what do you mean by that, Tony? Well, uh, we see 2 Timothy gives us some clues here. Uh, Paul's writing to Timothy. And he, <coughs> he says, all scripture is given by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what's wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. And he goes on in verse 17, says, using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable of having all that is needed to do every good work. Paul's saying, hey, okay, you want to be able to do the good things that God wants you to do in your life? Well, then what you need to do is cling to the scriptures because they are going to help you uh, do those things, to live those things out. And so, you know, as we approach the idea of, you know, dang, Tony, I just don't know. I, I wish God just wrote some things in the sky for me. Now, I, I, I don't ever, ever try to embarrass people, you know, so don't, if you're a guest here, my goal is not to single you out or embarrass you, but I'm raising my hand because I'm saying I'm here. You know, have you ever asked that question of yourself? Have you ever said, I wish God just made it clear. I wish God just wrote my message in the sky for me of what I'm supposed to do. If that's you, I want to see that I'm not alone here. Is there anyone else out there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, here, can I tell you what? And I saw a couple of you just kind of just like, I don't know if it's okay to raise my hand, so I'm just going to do this. And that's good. I'm good. You're making positive yardage because here, if you didn't raise your hand, guess what? I'm just calling you out. You're a liar, okay? You're, uh, every one of us, I guarantee you, every one of us at some point or another have said, if you've lived any longer than 10 years on this earth, you've said, I wish God made some things a little more clear for me. Well, you know what? And I'm not trying to be trite here, guys. But the reality is, is this here is God's message directly to us. It's not God's message to our parents and to our grandparents. It's God's message to us. It's not some archaeological historical document that we can read to become better educated people. It's living and sharper than a double-edged sword. It still has the ability to cut through us today and give us insight and give us direction. And so as I understand and as I approach God's word as a chat session from him, as his message, making it clear about things that I need to take on, about things that I need to do, about attitudes I need to have. As I begin to develop that and live that out, you know what I discover? I discover a lot of the things that I'm living in where I'm saying, God, I wish you just made things clear for me, are things like, well, should I have this job or should I take that job? Should I move here or should I move there? Should I, should I continue to live with my parents or should I get an apartment? And all of you, your parents out there, you're saying, hey, I can tell you what God said. Get out, right? That's, what, that's God's word for your kids, right? Get out. It's time to move on. Um, you know, we, we say those things. Well, God, I just, I just don't understand. Do you want me to do this or do that? Well, here's what I discovered. We're living here, and more. And hear me clearly. I know there's some of you that are asking this question, and it's a, a big deal. It's a, it's a big thing. Okay, I, I get that. But I also understand that for a majority of us, these questions are really about us, right? Me, 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 me. I, I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. Is this job better or that job? Should I have two kids or three kids? What well, you know? Me, 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 me. All about me. As we begin to live out on this side over here, in which we take the clear revealed word of God and apply that to our lives and begin living out of those things, we develop some things that the scriptures call the fruit of the spirit. You know, these are things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and mercy, 
self-control. These are things that we talk an awful lot about here at church. And, and as we begin living out of those things, you know what? It's just kind of funny. It, from my perspective, it seems like those questions and those things that plague us and those things that say, God, I wish you just put, put the handwriting on the wall or wrote it in the sky for me. A lot of those things just have a way of taking care of themselves. Or maybe they don't take care of themselves, but we begin to put them in proper perspective and we recognize they're not near as important as I originally thought they were. They're not near as big a deal. They're not, they don't have any kind of eternal value. They're not going to be around five years from now, much less 500 years from now. And so I begin to live with a different perspective in which I understand that, that God's word clearly reveals some attitudes, some directions, some, some actions to take in life. And I need to pursue those things hard, hard. And then as I do, the things that I get so concerned about, really, they kind of a lot of times end up in proper perspective. A, a third key that I would challenge you with is that you will trust the Bible. Better said, I'll say it the way I wrote it, a, a third key for me to get a better handle on my sword is that I will trust the Bible. I will trust the Bible. Jesus is talking about the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 5, he's talking about the importance of the Word of God. And he says this, he says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished in life. Now, in the end life is what he's, you know, it's not in the scripture there, but he's talking about in this world. Until everything is accomplished, until everything the Father has set into motion, uh, the scriptures will not go away. What's Jesus doing? He's putting a very high value on the scriptures. He's basically saying, look, guys, these are, this isn't some... This isn't some gossip brag that you're looking at today and you throw it away when you're done with it. Hey, this isn't some self-help book that affects a generation of people, but in, in five years from now, another self-help book is going to come and take the world by storm. He's saying, not until the world is over will the words that are contained in this book, the words that are contained in the Old and the New Testament, they will never pass away in this earth because they are so important because they breathe life into us. And so because of Jesus giving that authority to the scriptures, we can have a strong confidence in trusting the Bible, even when it's hard to trust, even when it doesn't make sense to us. You know, I've reflected on in my life and recognized that there are several times there are several times if we're just being dead honest, Tony Turner doesn't trust the Bible at times. There's times that I read something and I see an attitude and I just go, oh, I'd rather not do that. That's a little hard. It doesn't make sense to me. I just want to forget about that passage of Scripture. You know, uh, and as I thought about it, there's three three times and very specifically when I tend to do this. Uh, uh, first time, and this might be for you too, I would suspect it is, is when the Scriptures... Tell us to do something that we don't want to do. That's one time that we choose to throw away the scripture or choose to say, I know better than the Bible does. I know better than God's word. You know, like for, for me personally, I, okay, hey, I read Jesus makes a very clear point of love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And I'm sitting there reading that going, ah, that's not what I feel like. You know, someone over here hurt me, so I want to hurt him back. You know, can I go back, Jesus, can I go back to some, some laws and say stuff like, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Why don't we focus on that? But yet I'm still bludgeoned with the word of God in which Jesus says, no, 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 that's not, what I'm, that's not my word for you. My word for you is love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so when we want to embrace attitudes or actions that, that just go counter to what our hearts say and the scripture compels us to do opposite, we tend to choose to not trust the Bible. A second approach, a second thing that we tend to do is, is when cultural norms are counter to what the scriptures say, we're often tempted to not trust the Bible. When the culture lives a totally different way than what God's word shows to us, we tend to go to the culture. You know, there's, there's a guy, a, a, a pastor of First, uh, Second Baptist, uh, 
His name's John Marshall. Love, love John Marshall dearly, and and uh, I just think he's 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 a sharp man. I think he uh, lived life. He's been in ministry for so long. I I you know I matter of fact. Uh, someone says, well, you use a lot of John Marshall illustrations. I'm like, I know, and I'm sorry if that bores you. I just think he's an awesome pastor. Matter of fact, I, you know, I don't know why you all aren't at Second Baptist and allowing him to be your pastor because he's just such a great guy. I mean, I, he's a great man. And, and he was telling me one of the practices that he's done for a couple of years now is he has a small group. Uh, and it's not a small group. He, so that's, you know, John, you need to understand what a small group is. He has 40 to 50 people come to his home that are college students. Every week they come together. 40 folks gather together, 40 to 50 folks gathering together. These college students are the cream of the crop of his church, he told me. I mean, this is what he said. Uh, these are people that have grown up from, they were many of them born. They were going to church before they, in, in utero, you know, before they were out on earth, they were going to church. They went to every VBS that the church offered. They went to all of the children's stuff. They went to all the teenager stuff. They went, you know, they were involved now in college and career, and they were gathering at the pastor's house every week. These are the leaders. These are the future leaders of the church, according to John Marshall. And he said, you know, Tony, here's the amazing thing, that when we talk about sex and sexuality, with the exception of one person out of those 50 people, every head goes down to the ground. Every person's head goes down. Because the reality is, of 50 teenagers that have grown up with God's word, have grown up in the church, 49 of them have accepted what the culture says about sex and that there's no problem to hook up. And hey, it's just sex, so who gives a rip? And just you know, forget about the, the, the lessons that God's word says uh, uh, about word, the proper place of sex in a marriage. Uh, forget about all that stuff. And, and here you got 49 people living out what culture says, what, what their friends are saying, what their professors are saying, what the world is saying, what the media is saying, what movies and, and, and entertainment is saying. They're choosing to follow that versus what God's word says, and they know it says. You see, we do that, don't we? We, we allow cultural norms to dictate what reality says versus what the scriptures teach us. And, you know, a third area that I tend to lose the truth of the Bible and I choose to not trust the Bible is when the Bible interacts and, and puts something in front of me that's not even on my radar, something that I'd never heard about before, and so I just tend to minimize it. You know, like, for instance, fasting. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about fasting. Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. There's this expectation of this spiritual practice being a normal part of a believer's life, but yet most of us have never even thought about the idea of fasting because it's not on our radar, right? And so the moment God puts it on our radar, we go, well, that's a crazy thought. No, I'm not going to do that. And so it's not on our radar, and so fasting is one illustration, but there's many of them that, that God's word tells us, gives us insight, and we go, well, wait, 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 that's not, on my, that's not something important to me, so I'm going to choose not to do it. And I've learned to have a handle on God's word, the sword of the spirit. I have to trust it, even when I don't 100% understand it, right? Even when I don't fully get it. I trust that God's word is God's word, and I do the best I can to apply it to my life. And then a final thing I would say, for us to be able to wield the sword of God, the word of God, adeptly in our lives, is to create a plan. Create a plan. Develop a plan. Develop a plan. Passage that I want to bring to us today, 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 19. It says, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. The word of God made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. <clears throat> now, guys, there's not something here you go, well, okay, now what does that have to do with creating a plan? I, 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 I'm putting this passage in front of us because I want to show us and just remind us the glory of reading God's word. Of how, what up? Just allow, allow the words of God here to draw your attention. He's saying, hey, hey, 
Pay attention to the words of God. Pay, make certain you have it in your life. Because in your dark life, in the darkness that we experience in this world, it is like a light shining. It goes on to say, it's like, it's like the morning star rising in your heart. Oh, the glory of following God's word here. I mean, this isn't just some, hey, I'm going to spend time reading a little novel, spending a couple, figuring out how to spend 10 minutes of my day. This is the fact that in this dark place that we sometimes dwell, we can see a penetrating light coming through. And that penetrating light is not 10 people coming together, singing kumbaya and having positive feelings. It's the word of God penetrating the very darkness, the very essence of life in which we see hope and we see grace, and we see mercy, and that morning star of the Word of God can rise in your life too. And I'd say in order for that to happen, create a plan. Don't just sit back and say, oh, Tony, you're absolutely right, man. I need to be more engaged in God's Word, and I'm going to do it. And you sit back and you go, sometime this week, I'm going to read something and I'm going to sit down for some amount of time and I'm going to do it somewhere and it's going to happen sooner or later. If that's your approach, then let's just be honest, you're not going to do anything, okay? Don't BS yourself here. You're not going to do anything because nothing happens in life unless there's a plan to it. And so I would argue, develop the when, where, how, why, all those things. You know, and, and, and I don't have, there's, there, you know, I've heard people say, well, you got to do it in the morning because that's when holy people, you know, read their word. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a morning person. So for me, get up at five in the morning is not a very good plan. That's a matter of fact, a disaster for me. Or, well, you got to do it, you got to have a prayer closet. No, you don't. No, you don't. This is what I would say when in regards to place and in regards to time, uh, time spent, all those things. I, there's two things you should be looking for. Minimal interruptions maximum energy and focus. So find a place where there's minimal interruptions. No, you probably don't want to have it at the desk of your office if your office is the hub of your environment, of your work. If everyone's coming to your desk to get things done, then don't say, well, five, five minutes a day, I'm going to open up God's Word because guess what? During that five or ten minutes a day, you're going to have 25 interruptions of people coming to you. you might, for you, you might have to go to like the, the, you know, the hot water heater closet in your office. Go somewhere where no one's at. Get to where there's minimal interruptions wherever you're at, okay? And maximum energy. Where do you, can you give the best focus and the best time? Then figure out a way to carve some time to get alone with God's Word. And, and then I would say this, with the have a plan, don't, don't just go, okay, I'm going to flip through God's Word and just, okay, right there, that, there's, there's the chapter I'm going to read for today. No, no, pick a book of the Bible or choose to read through something systematically. And, and, and here's the great thing, okay? So it takes you, what, uh, 12, 13 years to get a high school diploma, you know, maybe 15 years for some of us, I don't know. Uh, it, it takes us, about takes four years for me, seven years to, you know, get go through college, whatever, uh, you know, with this, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't go through this in four or five years and go, okay, master it, and I get to move on. This is a lifetime process of shaping. So the good news is this. The good news is I, I don't have to say, well, I got to come up with the master plan, and I got to figure out which is the perfect order because I'm only going to be able to read Genesis one time and I'm done. No, I'm going to interact with the book of Genesis hundreds of times over my life. So the reality is, if you don't have a plan, just develop a plan. Say, I'm going to start reading through the Gospels, or I'm going to read through the book of Acts. Just say, I'm going to read through a passage of Scripture systematically. And guess what? You might sit back and go, wow, that, uh, that's a struggle for me. I, I'm going to have to find a different passage, some, another book that's a little more understandable. Fine, you can get that right the next time. The next time you're going around, it's time to form a new plan. Fine, change up the plan a little bit. Come up with a different book of the Bible to read. Uh, come up with a different theme to discover and to, to look through the scriptures on, right? Uh, you can do that, but create the plan. Create the plan. And I conclude today with this understanding, folks. I want you, and I, <coughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have started off with this in, in the talk. I don't know. Um, but we need to make it very clear that I am challenging you to get a better handle on your sword 
Not so that God can pat you on the head and say, oh, you're so much better than the person to your right and to your left. Oh, I'm so pleased in you. You're, you're just such a better Christ follower. Good for you. That's not the purpose of this. The, the purpose for us to handle the sword is not so that we can just become self-righteous and so that we become what the Bible calls a Pharisee, right? The purpose of the Bible is not, the purpose of me hanging and clinging to the sword is not for me to say, I got to do more things to impress God. I got to be a better person. I got to do, do, do. Because that's Phariseeism. The reason why I'm talking about this and the reason why we pay attention to this is because the reality, I cling and I work to become more adept at holding and wielding the sword of the Spirit of God because it, long time ago, cut through my heart. It cut through my life. It revealed a Savior that came and shed his blood on a cross and was put in a tomb and then raised out of that tomb, came crashing out of the tomb with all power and with all authority three days later. And that because of this living Savior making a sacrifice for me, the Word of God revealed that I could take hold of that and I could experience the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ and it changed me from the inside out and I know that I'm not the only person with that story in this room today and because of that word of God giving the message and breaking through the junk and the trouble and the and the just the terrible stuff in life and coming straight to the heart that showed me that I as it took hold of me I have to take hold of it I have no choice but to understand God's word better, to apply it deeper, to make it real to my life. Not because I'm a Pharisee, not because I'm self-righteous, not because I'm trying to be better than you, but because it is so glorious and so rich. How could I not do life without it, folks? And that's the truth for you too. And so I challenge you to take hold of the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Not for your self-righteousness, but because we have a Savior that is known as the Word. And my goal in life is to not just take hold of what's inside this book, but to take hold of Jesus. Pray with me. And Father God, we come before you Lord, we confess, we confess that there are many a nights where we could be spending time in your word, allowing it to cut to our hearts, allowing it to change us from the inside out, and yet we, we choose, I choose, I choose to watch a TV show that's just a moment of pleasure. I choose to, to read a, a book that, that just gives me a moment of entertainment or interest. We declare, God, and we recognize that your holy writ, your, the word of God, the Bible, is your perfect, unadulterated word. It gives us insight. It gives us life itself. It directs us, God. It speaks into us. It is living sharper than any sword that a human could make. It has the ability to cut through us to our very soul, to our very heart. We declare that and we confess that reality now and we ask for your forgiveness when we don't handle it with as much passion as it deserves. So God, I, I ask, would your spirit speak to our people today? In this room, give us the ears to hear very individual messages. Lord, challenge us to take the word of God and apply it to our lives. Not just be impressed with the trivia we learn, the knowledge we learn, but the soul change that happens as we are obedient to your word. These things we pray in your son's powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet and uh, join us in this song.
Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Sin comes deep, your grace is born. said amen man what an incredible morning thank you guys for being here we're glad you were here hope you experienced uh, uh, just a, a wonderful living loving God today uh, while you were here uh, you know one of the things that Tony said is developing a plan he talked about developing a plan something I want to uh, just encourage each of you to take part in is is uh, you know inside your your handout there's a yellow card looks just like this and uh, you know one of those things on there says you know what I need help applying God's word in my life and, you know, we have at Northbridge, I've been really excited about a team we've developed called our Connection Team. And it is full of, of uh, gifted people with the ability to mentor and to kind of help and follow you and, and kind of spur you on. And if maybe you're needing a little bit of encouragement in that area in your life, fill this out and drop this over in our connection area. There's a, it's the table right outside the, the garage door in the cafe area. Drop that over there. There's someone that will be over there that wants to chat with you. If you want to chat with somebody today, you can. Uh, maybe you just want someone to connect with you. And that's, this is a great way. It's a great tool of being able uh, to do that. So I encourage you to do that today. Um, just as Tony alluded to already, we're having some baptisms. Uh, right after this service out behind the building here. So about five, ten minutes we'll be getting going with all of that. So please stay around and be a part of that if you want to 
to, to witness that, celebrate that with uh, the people being baptized and their families, and that'll be an exciting time. Uh, small groups have kind of launched back up, not kind of, they are launching back up. And so if you're wanting to connect into a small group, please grab myself. Uh, you can also write that on this card as well. Connect with somebody at the connection team and we'll be happy to plug you in. Also, after the baptisms, there'll be a lunch going on over in the, in the uh, youth area, in our youth bay. And... Um, Lead Her, which is one of the ministries that we support uh, greatly. We're very appreciative of Lead Her uh, and Christy and, and that ministry. Uh, they're celebrating because Hannah, one of our own, Hannah, raise your hand, has decided to take a leadership position within there, and she is going to be over the international, is that correct, the international aspect or ministry of that area. And so they're going to have a lunch for her. There's pizza over there, and just going to have a time of prayer uh, for her as she moves on in that area of ministry in her life. So encourage anyone who wants to be a part of it, who wants to come over and pray with them, please do that as well. Again, I hope you've been blessed. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.